Greetings. I'm Guy Irwin, president of United Lutheran Seminary, and it's a delight to me to be the first to welcome you to this event of Preaching with Power, a lecture by the Reverend Dr. M. William Howard. He is a man of extraordinary accomplishments, and I'm proud to welcome him here, both as an honored colleague as former president of the New York Theological Seminary, and as a fellow worker in the vineyard of interchurch cooperation through his work leading the National Council of Churches. Both of these are special calls to very important work, and I give thanks to God for Dr. Howard and what he has accomplished for all of us in these roles. I only wish I could sit together with him afterwards so that I could learn even more from him. Welcome, Dr. Howard. It is especially appropriate, therefore, as we hear from a theological educator today, that I also take this opportunity to recognize two of our United Lutheran Seminary students who have received special recognition for their academic achievement as students in our Black Church concentration. This year, Rosetta Boyd and Robin Hinton are receiving the J.Q. Jackson Merit Scholarship. Ms. Boyd and Ms. Hinton are remarkable students and great leaders, and I ask you to join me in congratulating them and giving thanks to God for the leadership they are providing and will continue to give to the churches they serve. They are a blessing. I invite you now to prepare your hearts and minds for Dr. Howard's lecture by listening to a piano selection played by Scott Cumberbatch. We have come to know and love the way his gifts of music take us just to where we need to be. May God bless us in our listening and our learning. Amen.
Good morning. Welcome to the 39th Annual Preaching with Power Lecture. Our lecturer this year is the Reverend Dr. M. William Howard, Jr. Before I introduce him, let me join in with the president of our seminary, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin, in congratulating Rosetta Boyd and Robin Hinton, two seminarians in the Black Church Concentration who are being awarded this year the Merit Scholarship named in honor of the Reverend Dr. Joseph Quinton Jackson. We call it the J.Q. Jackson Scholarship on campus. Uh, the Reverend Jackson, along with Jeremiah Wright Sr., were the first two African-American graduates at our predecessor institution, Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. And so Rosetta and Robin, congratulations. How proud we are of you. At this time, let me introduce our guest lecturer. The Reverend Dr. M. William Howard Jr. is a native of America's Georgia. He is a graduate of Morehouse College and Princeton Theological Seminary. He is a civil rights activist and community outreach leader. He is former national staff member of the Dutch Reformed Church in America, former moderator of the program to combat racism for the World Council of Churches, former president of the National Council of Churches, former president of the American Committee on Africa. He ministered to U.S. personnel that was held in hostage in Iraq. And along with Reverend Jesse Jackson, he helped to secure the release of U.S. naval pilot Robert O. Goodman from Syria in 1983. Dr. Howard is also former president of New York Theological Seminary, former chair of the Rutgers University Board of Governors, and former pastor of the historic Bethany Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, my hometown, which is how I got to know Dr. Howard, because to live in Newark, you must know Bethany Baptist Church. <laughs> Having said that, Dr. Howard, welcome to United Lutheran Seminary. And as we get started, I want to uh, frame um, what we call a lecture slash webinar in this way. Uh, for those who are listening, uh, it is a lecture, but it will be prompted by questions by me. So Dr. Howard, in light of Black Lives Matter, especially what we witnessed last year in the nation's capital, compared to what we witnessed on January the 6th this year in the nation's capital, which I will call the Black Lives Matter protest versus a riot on January the 6th. You as a civil rights activist with such a rich career serving ecumenically in the World Council and National Council of Churches, also through your lenses as a theological educator and local pastor. My first question to you is how does the church, and when I use church here, I'm speaking of the universal church, I'm speaking of all churches across denominational lines, and in light of it being the black church and the white church in America, how do we respond to Black Lives Matter? Well, now, that is a very, Brother Quentin, you know how to ask questions, you know. <laughs> Let me just say that when we talk about the American church, we're really speaking far too broadly. Uh, if you speak in terms of the church populated principally by the sons and daughters of Africa, uh, that is almost distinct, not, not by theology or the best of Christianity, but by practice and tradition. Uh, that's pretty distinct separation there because the historic uh, Black congregations in this country uh, were provoked by the interpretation of Christianity through a racist lens. Uh, you might say that there is a black church because of the uh, expulsion of black Christians from the universal church by 
white believers. Uh, and so when you talk of race or Black Lives Matter, I think we have to begin by uh, appreciating that the doctrine of white supremacy really has roots in white theology, in the interpretation of the Ham story, for example, in the Old Testament as a foundation for the racial stratification that we now have in uh, the United States. Now, it's not peculiar to the United States, uh, but uh, as it is often said, it is uh, through slavery, uh, our original sin. So the black church perceives black lives matter uh, in a certain way because its uh, uh, parishioners have their eyes open to the reality of racism in America. And uh, the, the truth is, when you say Black Lives Matter, uh, you're really saying Black Lives Matter also, or Black Lives, uh, black lives Matter too, uh, because the evidence is historically from the, from the 1619 arrival of Africans, there is ample evidence that Black lives do not matter to the dominant society. If you look at enslavement, if you look at sharecropping, if you look at Jim Crow, if you look at de facto segregation, uh, Emmett Till, right on through George Floyd, and all the black bodies that have been left lifeless because of the quintessential American expression so uh, I would say the, the, if you look on the dominant tradition, now there have been white Christians who have been in solidarity uh, with Africans from the beginning. Many have lost their lives. Uh, but very often these very Christians who were in solidarity with us were estranged from their own families and communities. Mm. So th this is the American dilemma. Um, and therefore, when you speak of Black Lives Matter and how does the church respond, you'd have to see there is a distinct difference. Now, that's interesting. Um, I usually will listen to our guest lecturer from last year when we celebrated our 40th anniversary. And he says, can I push it? And so I'm going to use that term with you, can I push it? Um, two things I want to ask about what you just said. First of all, broad question, in America, and this is a hard question, but what would you say overall, how do whites view blacks in the U.S. in light of racism? So what I'm thinking of is that word guardian versus opposition. Uh, I'm not qualified to answer <laughs> that. Uh, what, I, what I can tell you yeah. is uh, if you look through the lens of conscious Black people in America, many of whom are found in churches, some are not. Uh, if you look at the party that has just lost power in the United States, uh, that, pa that party is perceived as a political instrument to make America great again. Now, through the eyes of Black folk, we are still in the process of trying to make America great from our point of view. So we're, we're not sure when America was actually ever great and so therefore, when a politician calls the population to make America great again, we presume we're talking about an America uh, where the rights and uh, citizenship uh, options for black people were extremely limited. 
uh, are we going to make America great in the 1950s before the Brown decision? Are we going to make America great back to the 1920s, the season of open lynching of black people? Are we going to make America great again when we were in bondage before uh, the 14th, 13th and 14th amendments? Exactly. Uh, when was America great? And it appears that this part of America uh, represents a significant percentage of the population. So I'm not, I'm not qualified to say where America stands so much on the race question. All I know is where power is concerned, there is a concerted effort to assert uh, an identity of the country uh, that is contrary to the interest of black people still looking for full citizenship and freedom. So remember I said I was gonna push it with two questions. The second one on that is we must admit racism is global. So it's not just an American thing, it is a global thing. But unique to America with ours is enslavement and white supremacy. What would you say is the bearing of those two in the form of racism that we have experienced versus the way racism is done throughout the world? I hope I said that correctly. How, you mean how, how is America standing out in relation? Yeah, what's the to, difference yeah. with the racism in America versus the rest right, of the right. world? Yeah. Right. Well, of course, you know, through the uh, PCR in the World Council, I've been exposed to right. uh, 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 groups that are uh, racially oppressed in different parts of the world. Uh, in Japan, for example, Koreans are treated in a certain discriminatory way. Uh, in so-called Latin America or South America, the indigenous people are uh, marginalized. Uh, in France, the Algerians have a rough time. I, I could go on and on and on. But uh, the United States, uh, by having been built on the institution of chattel slavery, um, and, and having, the, see, in the, in the beginning, at the time of the slave trade, there was no theory of black inferiority. Power simply uh, uh, kidnapped, and I might say with the cooperation of uh, tribal interests in Africa, uh, these uh, black people who were brought here. And then there had to be, in part because of Christianity, a theory developed uh, of the inferiority or the natural limitations of black folk, mentally and so forth. And, um, and just as the Civil War ended, there was a genuine effort to reverse this uh, trend that was deeply rooted by then in our culture, keeping in mind that uh, black people uh, were residents of this land over 150 years before the Declaration of Independence. So the, the notion of black inferiority was seeping into the soil of the country for many years. But after the Civil War, Reconstruction uh, was an, an attempt uh, to rectify the errors of our ways. But uh, as you know, re Reconstruction uh, after the death of Lincoln uh, was uh, suppressed and destroyed and the Ku Klux Klan and other white terrorist groups asserted themselves and reimposed the hegemony of the old racist doctrine. And uh, we haven't recovered from that yet. Um, and uh, you've had uh, uh, in the civil rights movement, another 
glimpse of light that perhaps the nation was coming close to a breakthrough with respect to race and so forth. Uh, and then you had a backlash uh, in the 70s, uh, you know, and the vehicle for that was Mr. Nixon uh, suppressing the aspirations of the civil rights movement. And it's an endless cycle. Uh, so that Barack Obama, as a matter of fact, can be credited with a number of things, but one of them is reigniting the anxiety of the white population regarding uh, the changing demographics of the nation. And white Christians, incidentally, have not had a faith sufficiently strong to liberate them from the need to elevate themselves at the expense of other human beings. And so they are frightened at the notion that other human beings who have not originated in Europe uh, might have as their goal being as mean to them as they were to us. So this is the uh, uh, sort of endless cycle of repetition, which has now grown to the point that we would have at the hands of the party of Lincoln an attempt to overthrow the government. That is interesting. I, I do want to return back to uh, President Barack Obama, um, but I do want to ask this question prior to that. Is, is it possible if we cannot eliminate racism, how do we mitigate racism? Yes. Well. Racism is a reflection of the brokenness in humanity. The Christian would say that, a brokenness, a, a lack of security uh, and, and uh, a lack of grounding in their own identity. And so as you go around the world, uh, you see people, or even in this country, you see class distinction. You can see among people of European descent, uh, an unspoken uh, uh, attitude toward Europeans from Southern Europe, for example. Um, you can go to Africa and see tribal distinctions that uh, denigrate people. I mean, that's all a part of the human journey. Uh, but how do you mitigate this? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a constant struggle. And uh, I think our lot as human beings is eternal vigilance. But I think one way we do this in this country is, and I do think the United States has embarked on a very unique and promising experiment. Uh, the notion of uh, every citizen having the same rights under law and having law determined by open and fair uh, and free elections, uh, law can do a lot to contain the uh, 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 sort of unbridled uh, animal instinct of the human being to be uh, cruel to other people. Now, education can also be, uh, but since we're in the realm of the church, you have to wonder, uh, why is it that faith, uh, and I mean a faith where the person surrenders to the power of God, has yet to help us embrace one another. So uh, is there a brand of faith waiting for us out there that could not just convince the head, but the heart of the human being, uh, that we all are floating around on the same ball together. Uh, and if we're not convinced that we belong to each other, maybe climate change will teach us that. Maybe the pandemic, which spreads without respect to uh, persons, as the Bible says, uh, will teach us that. Uh, but until such a time as this, we will need to have uh, laws in a society where law is respected 
as a ground rule for an organized society so that, for example, uh, you and I can live in a neighborhood of our choice by law, even if our neighbors resent it, at least the law allows it. So uh, that's, that's a partial answer. I don't think it's a full answer. And anyone who claims to have the full answer, by the way, uh, uh, don't let him sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was good. But it, so it does bring me back to that first original question about how does the church respond with this? And I, I bring this question up only because I have heard you um, over the course of time listening to you respond, what must the church do? And two of the things that you mentioned was confess, and I'll let you explain what that means, but I remember because I wrote notes down and then engage. And in that engagement, you were speaking of engaging with your own. Could you explain to us as we go back to how does the church respond to Black Lives Matter? What must the church do when it comes to confession and engagement? Well, uh, just to to dispense with those terms rather quickly and then yeah. to uh, dig a little bit into this question. I think confession is often mistaken as an oral exercise. And confession is at the center of the Christian gospel. Uh, but confession is, the oral part is merely a promise to confess. Um, Confession is going in a different direction, living a different life, uh, giving evidence of a changed commitment. And to, to press this a little further about the church, you see, in the South, and we're pleased, we're pleased that liberal white people from the South, but also from the North, came to the South in the 60s, uh, uh, demonstrated, many of them at great risk to their own lives. But let me take you to the decision of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. After many experiences, especially after uh, Freedom Summer in Mississippi 1964, they began to say to their white peers, who had uh, come south to work with us, please, would you please go back to where you came from and organize your own communities in solidarity with us? That, by the way, is what led in part to the Students for Democratic Society. But this is a, an issue with the predominantly white church, the white congregation. And uh, white congregations with good hearts often want to come and be missionaries to us, when in fact, they should be missionaries to their own community. Meaning, if you have a, a white believer, uh, a John Brown, if you will, in the neighborhood and you are a convicted Christian, uh, you have to go door to door. You have to uh, work with people in your own fellowship to help them see things as you do, rather than doing the easy work, the relatively easy work of coming over to my community. Now, uh, I'd love to have conversations with you uh, and be in touch with you but your primary vineyard must be where you live and serve. And uh, see at Bethany, and you know Bethany, oh, yeah. if I get up and preach a sermon about the transformation of society, people stand up and applaud. But if my white colleague in Summit preaches a sermon to his predominantly white congregation, in that way, he might get fired. You see, this is the dilemma that we face. And Dr. King said it best, others have echoed him, the most segregated hour in America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning 
that is before the pandemic. It's interesting you said that about the minister. Um, I um, mentored indirectly uh, a Presbyterian minister who was at a local seminary here in Philadelphia. Um, he was serving as a waiter at a frequent place that I go to prior to the pandemic. Uh, he was recently called to a church and he's trying to engage the congregation. So he says, Dr. Q, via email, can you give me some suggestions on how I can help my congregation to deal with own systemic racism? We ask denomination and local church. And I'll be honest with you, I felt it hard. And, and maybe I, I, I hear you when you said the minister could get fired. When I heard him, I started thinking the same thing, like, young man, you just got to the church. Don't get fired next week for this. But I was curious, how could all what you could tell me, how could I help my mentee to help him engage his congregation? Because I did say to him via email, I said, they will hear from you better than they would hear from me. So it is your task to engage your own community. But I did not know how to advise them on how to do that. Well, you know, <laughs> we all have to learn better how to preach a gospel that tells the truth about uh, the human being and the prospects of human society. Uh, without respect to culture, without respect to the, the, the standing tradition and assumptions. You see, that pastor is, uh, when he comes to the, he or she comes to a congregation, they're not preaching to a blank slate. Uh, they're preaching not only to people who think they know what the gospel is, but he's, he or she is preaching to a congregation that has been uh, knowingly or unknowingly saturated with a doctrine of presumed uh, 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 privilege. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's not even recognized by most white people I know. They wake up in the morning privileged. When they're pulled over uh, by a police officer, they presume it's a friendly stop, even if the officer is going to give them a ticket, if they're reasonably respectful to the officer, they get the same treatment. Um, you know, I often wonder if I heard banging on my door at night, three o'clock in the morning, bang, bang, bang. And I say, well, who's at my door? It's the police open immediately. Well, based on the experience of my people with the police, I might be enticed to get a weapon to defend myself <laughs> because the experience is if I open the door and say, officer, what on earth is wrong? I mean, that might be the end of my life. This is the reality. And this pastor has to preach a gospel that has sufficient power to produce confession, to produce a sense of renewal and a new start in faith that starts to reject this paradigm. And that's a very hard thing to do. Not, not just for the pastor, but for the people. You see, who abandons privilege? Who says, you're going to give me certain rights? Well, I reject them if you don't give them to my brother Quentin. You see, uh, that's, a, that's a lot to ask. And I think the Christian gospel at its core, says to us, if we're going to have a new life in Christ, 
we will be empowered somehow by that good news to abandon the accoutrements of the old way. That gospel has not been preached. Instead, we get a gospel that confirms the status quo, that affirms uh, the, the pattern uh, that has been set. And uh, that is what places this young pastor in a position of being at odds with the congregation. In fact, if they preach a socially redemptive sermon just before the call, they won't get the job. <laughs> that is quite interesting. And to finalize this one, before I go back to the question I said I really wanted to go to with uh, President uh, Barack Obama, how would we flip it for an African-American pastor who's engaging a predominantly African-American congregation? How do you help them? Um, with social justice, uh, how to respect all people, even though they may feel oppressed. Now, I know you're saying, Dr. Howard, you, you should know that already. You are a Black preacher. You should, <laughs> but I want our students and those that are listening to hear from you. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know a little of my background. Um, I was quite an adult before I entered the local congregation. Correct. And um, I had an opportunity to see the church from uh, radically different angles before arriving uh, at, a, at a, uh, a pretty traditional place like Bethany, well-established. Um, but you, you have to, to approach the answer to this question you have to think about what is the historic role of the church in the black community? And a lot of people, especially those who don't go to church, think of the church primarily as a, uh, a, 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 a vineyard for social action, a, a, a place where the people who go there uh, populate those pews because they want to create some new political reality. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, African people have invested their lives, their riches, uh, their heritage, their hope in the church, not because the church is going to challenge the system, uh, but because they needed a place of refuge, a place of affirmation, a place to be empowered, to be fully human, a fellowship, community, uh, soothing, and some notion of a connection with the divine power. Uh, one of the biggest purposes of the Black church is it, it is a place where we can be buried in dignity. Uh, that that uh, human respectful things can be said about us after we've passed away. I mean, something as basic as that. Now, it's also a place of entertainment, of culture, and of course, what would the church be without its music? And every now and then, a leader will come along who is interested in community engagement of a justice ministry, maybe even an interest in politics. And if that clergy leader is meeting the needs of the people on those other levels, the congregation will often be supportive. But if you got a preacher who only wants to do politics and social action, but never visits the elders, that's a losing proposition. Now, uh, Black churches are very diverse. Even within congregations, the people are diverse on many levels. Education-wise, social outlook, sometimes nationality. And for sure, 
theology. I always refer to Bethany as a, a radically diverse group because if I just pick 10 people at random from the congregation, invite them to the pastor's office and ask them to tell me, uh, why do they follow Jesus? Unless they repeat some line they learned in Sunday school, they all have different answers. But it all goes back to uh, uh, the ordinary human things that people did not see uh, when they moved around in the broader society. They found that in the church. So at Bethany, we have greeters, greeters. The ushers bring you inside, but the greeters meet you at the door. And we don't want any greeters who had a bad day, right? We want greeters who are excited about meeting people because when you arrive at that door, after being buffeted by racism 24-7, uh, all those other days before you got to the church, people want to feel welcomed unconditionally. And this is the role that church has played. Now, uh, clergy, I'm going to say this. Uh, if you're a good preacher of the gospel, if you get people engaged and they feel the message, not just hear it, but feel the message in a way that even temporarily gives them a sense of relief in terms of what they experience on a daily basis. You don't have to register voters. You don't have to lead a protest. Uh, you are meeting your basic function uh, as a pastor. Now, I'm not sure that I'm happy with that all the time, but churches that have tended to do this uh, uh, tend to fare very well. Now, you take someone like Jeremiah Wright at Trinity before he retired. He did both. And you had an explosion of membership and community engagement and fellowship and so forth. So, uh, but, but if Jeremiah Wright just preached good sermons and never went outside of the church door, there is some likelihood that his pews would be filled. Now let's keep that in mind. That, that is my observation uh, of, of, the, of the black church and the role of the black church. And, and in every human institution, you have people who violate the ethos uh, of the pure significance of the thing and uh, black leaders in churches are no exception to this. Uh, Raphael Warnock, now Senator Warnock, has written a great book called The Divided Mind of the Black Church. It's a very interesting uh, book on this subject that I would urge your audience to, to read. That is rich. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, where you are in life now, we call you an elder statesman because you shared such wisdom with us. Thank you, thank you. That is very enlightening. Um, I mentioned earlier, so I wanted to wrap up um, with this particular question and then hope that you could share in the response um, the story I've heard you say about the two sisters um, with their different views on this particular president. Uh, my question is, what was the backlash of the presidency of Barack Obama? And let me just state before that question is that I raised as an African-American in the inner city of Newark, New Jersey, never thought that I would see a black president. I mean, it just wasn't on my radar. My parents both passed prior to his election in 08. However, I had a picture of both of them next to my TV at home when I came home early that day to watch the inauguration. You know, like I'm not staying in work today. I'm going on because this is January the 20th, 2009, and I want to see this African-American 
inaugurated as president of the United States. And the, and the, the sense that I felt, no, I was not physically present with that large crowd, but I looked over at the picture next to my TV and saw my parents. And I actually began to cry because I said, wow, you didn't live long enough to experience what your son is experiencing. But having said that, back to the question, what, was there any backlash um, to his presidency when it comes to what we are experiencing in America, especially around racism? And if you could end it with that story of the two sisters, I would really appreciate it because I think that's such a rich story. And it really, it really captures <laughs> the American dilemma and the presumptions that lie in the, in the core or at the center of the American dilemma, the two sisters. But you know, uh, my a great deal of my early adult life was spent on international issues. You mentioned my having ministered to people uh, in Iraq. Actually, it was Iran. And I know you know that, but oh. you said in the beginning, it was in Iran. So thank you. you know, thank you. I mean, literally, on ev virtually every continent uh, in Europe and in, in Asia, Latin America, in Africa, um, and, and so I have an appreciation for particularly Africans uh, living in the diaspora. Uh, so I want to be clear about that. Uh, you know, my wife and I own a, a place in the Caribbean and we, we love going to be in the Caribbean. But I am a person who likes to point out that there is something called the Negro tribe. There is this group of Africans who came from many ethnic traditions in Africa, but they were molded by slavery into a common identity. And they uh, have lived through chattel slavery on the American soil. They have lived through the sharecropping hoax that came afterwards, which was a brutal period in American life. And uh, I, I like Isabel Wilkerson's portrayal of the way we were really uh, 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 propelled from the South to the North, resisting that system of uh, de facto slavery. And then we lived through Jim Crow. We lived through lynchings and, and humiliation. I listened to uh, little white girls in the grocery store refer to my grandmother as girl or by her first name. I mean, all of these indignities have created an identity that I call the Negro tribe. And Obama was not a member, nor is our current vice president. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? These are outstanding human beings and I am happy to have them go forth and represent my country. But America still has a peculiar problem with the Negro. I'm telling you a, a, a serious truth right now. America has a serious problem with the Negro. I was a floor leader for Jesse Jackson in his first campaign for president. And I saw up close the tremendous anxiety uh, that uh, is provoked by the emergence of Negro power in America. Barack Obama married a genuine Negro. I remember in Bethany saying I was endorsing a woman for president. And of course, people were really confused because they thought I was about to endorse Hillary Clinton. But I endorsed Michelle Obama because she being 
a descendant of these people I'm trying to describe, not in an exclusive sort of way, but in a way of defining sociologically what we're dealing with. Barack evoked from the white population, first of all, some, a sense of pride that America had achieved this result. And, and they were saying, this spells the end of, uh, uh, this is, uh, they called it the post-racial America. You see, post-racial America. But for others, it represented almost a primordial threat. And they began to uh, 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 burn him in effigy. They began to appear at his marches with, with uh, assault rifles. I don't know if you remember these days. And of course, these all follow uh, Trump's birther garbage, you see. Uh, and so at that point, the Brookings Institution and other uh, well-established research groups in America began to uh, document that by, let's say, 2045, uh, the United States would not have a majority uh, white population. It doesn't mean there wouldn't be any white people. They just wouldn't be majority dominant white uh, 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 rulers of the country. And that is really the way we explain January 6th. That is the way we explain how Donald Trump, the, the uh, quintessential con man from New York, could harness the fears of ordinary Americans from every walk of life and turn them into an anti-democratic force, which is what we see today. And um, you, you see that the, it's a myth that a big slice of the country was, com was committed to democracy. You see that a big slice of the population, many of whom go to church, I might add, are prepared to sink the American experiment if it means that a white man will share citizenship with you. And I mean full citizenship. I don't mean the crumbs from the table of citizens, but genuine citizenship. And the white Christian has to go to church and ask of their God, why have you not liberated me from this brokenness? Why is it, why is it that your blood has not redeemed me from this myth of my superiority. To acknowledge that you're not superior is not to say you're worthless, you see? But, you know, I, I grew up in the rural South, as you know, I mean, small town South, not rural, but small town. My town was 15,000 people, I guess. And I saw many white people, many white people, in my town, who I would bet didn't have the same breakfast that I had. They certainly didn't have the warm coat I had. Do you understand? But yet they took pleasure in calling me a derogatory name. What is it that propels poor white people to align themselves with ultra rich white people who it can easily be illustrated, don't have the interest in mind. It's the Negro tribe and the presumption that our goal is not simply full participation in a country that we love, but it's somehow retaliation, you see? And that brings me to the two sisters. As you know, the story, <laughs> uh, there were two, two elderly sisters. Uh, 
maybe they were octogenarians and they lived together for a very long time. And one was a rabid supporter of Barack Hussein Obama. She handed out flyers, she wore her, her uh, badge and so forth, and she was proud to support Obama. But her sister who loved her so much was exactly the opposite. And somehow a national correspondent heard about these sisters and went to interview them. And uh, he interviewed the one who was a big Obama supporter and then he turned to the sister who opposed him. And he, uh, he said, you've heard what your sister said about Obama. He's a decent family man. He's well-educated. He's personable. You know, all of these things, you know, that made him her candidate. Uh, do you take issue with this? And the sister sitting in the presence of her sister, she said, well, you know, it, it's hard to disagree. It's hard to disagree with what she's saying, but, but you know, if he becomes president, what are they going to do to us? And that's the story. The presumption that black people are waiting to take over the government so they can now have a mass slave rebellion is about as ignorant as anything I've heard. But it's it, 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 when framed within the American uh, uh, structure, I can get that. I remember uh, in my hometown at my church, a woman passed away, one of the members passed away, and she did housework, as we say, at the home of a middle-class white family, not wealthy, uh, but she had worked with these people for many years. And so somehow it was arranged. The family she had worked for wanted to come to our church to her funeral. And the offices of our church reserved on the opposite side of the aisle from the family, two front pews for the visiting white family. And I learned quite serendipitously that the white family thought they were put on the front pew because they were white. In fact, they were put on the front pew out of respect for their relationship with the deceased. But their minds were so poisoned, they couldn't see the latter. They could only see it through the lens of their whiteness. And the Christian gospel to the white Christian has failed white people in this regard, why do I have to believe, I say again, that I'm superior to another human being in order to be human myself? Dr. Howard, that is so rich. Wow, what a way to bring this to an end. And because I am a preacher, as you were speaking, the scripture came to mind. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. Maybe that's a good way to close right there. That The fear that you spoke of, if we would just embrace love. Well, let's with that sound that. mind, think correctly. <laughs> well, let's, let's quote Martin. He's a good person to, to go quote ahead. at the end of a session, right? You know, he had that session about snatching, uh, what did he say? Victory. Oh, victory. From the jaws of defeat, right? And um, That's powerful. And racist white Christians uh, 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 snatch racism 
from the jaws of Christian love. Mm. You see that? In other words, Christian love is just about to envelop hatred and racism, but they reach in there and snatch it out, you see? And uh, if, you, if you watch that series, The Black Church, produced uh, by PBS and so on, uh, just aired not long ago, um, <laughs> you, you see uh, in, in that whole uh, movement, the Black Church movement, uh, you, you, you see people being overcome by the Spirit, people being brought to their knees by the Spirit, people who feel the gospel content in their very bones, as we would say. Uh, and, and, and there was some reference to Azusa Street and the emergence of Pentecostalism and how that movement was led by black people in Southern California. And, and what we have today in uh, uh, the Church of God in Christ and other holiness or Pentecostal churches. Uh, white people were a part of that Pentecostal movement but they evolved, they snatched, they snatched racism and the doctrine of white supremacy from the jaws of Christian love. Just as Pentecostal love was about to, to snuff out the fire of bigotry and ignorance, they grabbed it back again. And so now you see uh, so-called white evangelicals not just in the South, but all over the country, preaching a word that has absolutely nothing to do uh, with Jesus. Nothing. And, and here's, here's from a guy who's been in Nazareth, okay? I can tell you, there's nothing to do with Jesus. It had only to do with the illusion of white supremacy and white privilege, period and wrapped in some kind of uh, 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 language uh, that is connectable to the Bible. Now, so-called mainline white churches, uh, they're not that much better off. They have simply uh, allowed those people, and, and this is very harsh, but true, to do their bidding. They have a much more sophisticated, subtle way of managing their presumed superiority because they have not been touched where it matters by a gospel that allows them to let go. And that's where we are. Thank you again, Dr. Howard. I look forward to the engagement of our students and alum. Uh, I see beautiful opportunities of discussion in the classroom based on your lecture today. So again, thank you. And on a personal note, thank you for not just, when I mentioned Dr. Uh, President Barack Obama, thank you for mentioning my classmate. We graduated from Howard the same year, 1986, Kamala Harris. Woo. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> on behalf of United Lutheran Seminary for sharing with us and uh, God bless you and your ministry. Thank you for joining us. I pray you were blessed by our guest preacher. Please note that the thoughts and opinions of our guests are not necessarily the views of the seminary. At this time, I would like to appeal to you to consider making a contribution to support Preaching With Power and in so doing, you support scholarship funds that support students that are in the Black church concentration. There are three scholarship funds. The main scholarship fund that all of our students in the Black church concentration receive assistance from is the Reverend Dr. Joseph Q. Jackson Scholarship Fund. There are two other funds that we also collect for each year. There's the Bishop Ernest C. Morris Senior Scholarship Fund that is designated for students who are members of the Church of God in Christ. And then there's the Dr. Grover and Irma Wright Scholarship Fund. 
which is designated for African-American Lutheran students who are in seminary. Of course, you can give online. And if you do give online, you just go to uls.edu backward slash give. And as we show that on the screen, you will see that site. And you can choose either of those funds, you will see them listed. Designate your amount and submit giving. Some of you would like to send a check. Please make your check payable to United Lutheran Seminary. And in the memo section, make sure you identify which scholarship fund you would like it to go to. And you can mail it to United Lutheran Seminary, Attention UTI Office. That is 7301 Germantown Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, 19119. And please keep in mind that if you do not have the ability to give today, you can always send a gift or go online later to give. But help us to support. As I've said, there's never been a more pressing time to help students that will serve the black church as we see what is happening in our world today. So help us to produce those leaders for the black church. Thank you and God bless.